So with that, I'd like to welcome Rick Kelman, Iris Product Management, to introduce the panel. Rick, the virtual mic is yours. Thank you, Rosemary. And welcome everyone to our panel on performance optimization uh, for FileMaker and FileMaker Cloud. As Rosemary said, I'm Rick Kalman, Director of Product Management for the Claris FileMaker platform. I'll be your moderator today. Joining me uh, on the panel are Mark Richmond from Skeleton Key, Nick Lightbody of Desk Space Systems Limited, and from Claris, we have Lucy Chen, who's our VP of Engineering for the FileMaker platform, along with the best of our FileMaker and server resources. Clay Makel, who is our Chief um, uh, FileMaker Architect, Guest star, John Thatcher, one of our original server architects, uh, is joining us. Wei Ju, who is a FileMaker server and security architect for Claris. Yi Chang, who is a server development manager. Uh, and Maso Otto and Connor Brock uh, from QA, who are key testers for our platform. Believe it or not, this panel has over 150 years of experience with FileMaker. Uh, but why I'm the only one with gray hair, I don't know. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, some of the topics we're going to cover today, FileMaker performance optimization tips, the role of hardware and what it plays in performance tuning, LAN versus WAN, performance considerations, how to best optimize for the cloud, and how to optimize for FileMaker WebDirect and um, mobile with FileMaker Go. So, um, you know, happy everyone's here. Uh, and it'd be great to have you, Mark Richmond, kick us off and give us a little bit of background um, for your company, Skeleton Key, and how you approach the topic of performance optimization, particularly in the cloud. So over to you, Mark. Oh, I'm I'm muted. Muted. There you go. Oh, there we go. Thank you. It's great to be amongst uh, such a great panel of esteemed engineers. I'm really excited to see some of the folks uh, who've joined us sort of by surprise. Um, I'm not sure if I've lost some kind of connection. Are you still seeing me? There we go. Yeah, you're good. So anyway, um, I want to give a simple answer. You know, we're pretty pragmatic around here at Skeleton Key. We have such a mix of developers with varying skills from junior developers to senior, and we work on such a range of systems, both complex and simple. I really feel like it comes down to some of the sort of basics. Um, and these are things I would really attribute to having learned from John uh, back in 2009. Um, and I had some Cisco networking and engineering experience before, and so I came with kind of a developer network engineer mindset when I started developing and learning about how FileMaker really works. So I think it boils down to four things. Um, good data modeling. So it means understanding relational theory and having some basic understanding of how to build relational databases, period, and understanding how you can make smaller and more narrow tables or use joins like one-to-one -one joins. Um, understanding how FileMaker moves data. And so smart data management, You know, understanding what makes records move, understanding the exact way that records move between the client and the server, um, making sure you're not triggering data unnecessarily uh, and in particular something we couldn't do back then but which we can do now leveraging perform script on server whenever you can um, keeping the ui simple um, you know uncluttered layouts that are easier to use for users and easier to load and render for the various clients and then of course something we didn't have back in 2009 but something that is now available to us using themes so you have more efficient performance at the layout level and then finally i think a really important one that i would tip the hat to a lot of other people in the community and that's planning building your solutions with the WAN in mind, performing development and testing in a simulated environment with the right kind of data and the right kind of load. So you're not just building locally on your machine and then being surprised when you get into the wild. Um, I feel like if we can get any of our developers of any skill level to learn those four basic principles and to really make sure they lay those foundations on any solution, uh, everything else we do is icing on the cake. Great, uh, thanks a lot, Mark. Um, and Nick, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to you next and give us a, a bit of a background of your company. Uh, and then um, where do you suggest that, that a Claris FileMaker user, um, how do you suggest they can make the best performance gains uh, when they're building their custom apps? Uh, you're on mute, Nick. Right, thanks, Rick, and uh, thanks for having me. Uh, back in the day, I was a, attorney and i wanted to run my business more efficiently somebody introduced me to filemaker and in 1997 i started creating something to build my own firm to manage my own firm and i think i can probably say and i think i've said this to john thatcher in the past i must have made every single mistake you can ever make as a filemaker developer i learned the hard way 
although I had a background in computing way back with ICL mainframes in the 70s, um, I, I was seduced by the ease with which FileMaker enabled you to do stuff very easily when you got started. And what I learned the hard way is that you've got to be really careful about what you ask FileMaker to do to get the best out of it over WAN. So when you build an app, you're creating an element in the machine. But that machine comprises hardware, network, user load, and the thing you actually can build in FileMaker, which is the actual app, the solution, and its complexity. And all those different components are going to work together. And although you can control the content of the app most easily, you need to bear in mind what you're trying to ask FileMaker to do. So the starting point for me, eventually, when I, I learned my lessons, are that you have to think about what FileMaker is good at, and you have to try and ask it to do as little as possible. So a really good example there is that when you start building your system, FileMaker will automatically index everything in the site. All the fields all get indexed automatically. Fantastic. If you use other systems, you appreciate that convenience. But of course, you don't necessarily need to index all those fields. And, and any given file can easily become five times the size as it gets indexed. So what you need to do is to turn off the things you don't need. So if we say that hardware is giving you the power to solve solutions, that the network is going to try and slow things down. And if you then divide those two components and say you've then got to apply load, which is users, and also the complexity of your solution, you've got those four different things you can change. And a really good example, going back a few years now, but something that most FileMaker developers will have come across is the situation where people create a multiplicity of relationships in their system in order to create some form of report. The classic one, I can remember sitting with a friend in, in Campbell, not far from Santa Clara in the Bay Area, and looking at her system, and I think she had 52 relationships, one for every week of the year to create reports you know and then there maybe there are other ones that somebody had 365 relationships just to get one for every day now when farmic introduced the what i call the, the 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 fmql query that meant you could dispense with all of those relationships and do the thing in a different way and the point is filemaker will automatically evaluate everything that can be seen from the context of the layout and hence the table of currents upon which you are currently sitting. And that's fantastic, because if you built other systems, you know you have to tell it to do stuff. Farmaker does it for you. But if you give it a multiplicity of different things to evaluate, that will take time, because the laws of physics dictate, don't they, Rick? You can't mm -hmm. get, you know, you can't put more and more jobs into the thing and still have it coming out fast. So simplicity, ultimately, it's, it's, it's about simplicity. It's about looking at what you actually need and taking out all the things you don't need in order to give FileMaker the ability to look really, really fast. And I've built stuff that is super fast, doing a lot of stuff using FileMaker's strengths, but avoiding doing the stuff that you can do, but it's just really not a good idea over when. And I'm sure that our experts here are going to give us a long list of all those things you shouldn't mm. be doing. Uh, so thanks for uh, for that uh, uh, intro into this topic, Nick. Um, and um, you know, now that we're in a, a cloud first era, uh, and WAN environments are far more common than they used to be back in the day, uh, Maso, I'm going to start with with you with this question, and then I think it will naturally probably go over to John as well. Uh, but one of the questions we have is, how do you know um, what operations are done on the client and server side, and how do you optimize for the WAN? Uh, you're muted, Maso. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so um, in the FileMaker, uh, um, some of the operation done by the um, client side, and also the server side when you open the um, remote file. Um, so um, um, the, the find operation, this is done by the, um, the server side. However, uh, if you use some type of the uh, calculation function, um, so um, 
we some uh, we send some information to the, uh, client information to the server and it's uh, still performed on the server side. Right? Uh, however, um, um, some uh, sort operation um, the replace find uh, replace field contents. This is required to have the uh, the uh, data uh, record data. So that data is downloaded to, to the um, client side and then do the perform. So this is uh, something um, um slow down the when you um the file on the, the um, one network. So this is a place uh, maybe you can op optimize to uh, make a, a solution perform faster. So do the um um replace find uh, replace feed of contents uh, operation on the, the server side. So use the um a perform script on the server script that you can um send the operation on the server side to um uh, offload some uh, task on the the client. Great, uh, thanks, um, Masa. I think. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, so I, I think John have more uh, information about you know what you know um the operation done by the client side and the server side and how to optimize. He did it a great um the presentation back in the uh, year two thousand seven. Yeah. So you know, hey, um, John, I'm sure you've forgotten more than most of us will ever know about server performance. Um, and you've done some uh, very, um, you know, well received over the years under the hood sessions. So what is your advice um, regarding this topic? Um, well, hi, Rick and everyone. Um, I'm back uh, working uh, on Atomic or temporarily, um, not, not permanently. Um, and if those of you who don't know me, uh, I worked for Coiris uh, starting in 1989, so uh, 27 years, um, <clears throat> most of it on FileMaker. So um, as Masao was saying, uh, one of the big things to watch out for is actually unstored calculations. Um, those, uh, are, those have to be done on the client side. And so uh, you really want to avoid uh, um, your solutions allowing the client to do a find in an stored calculation field. Um, obviously, you also want to make sure that uh, the the fields that the clients can do finds on are indexed, uh, because that's going to give you the best possible speed on the server. It's going to shrink down the list of records and uh, really reduce the amount of network traffic, uh, which is what uh, Mark was. Uh, pointing out at the very beginning. Um, that really is the balance uh, because, um, you know, all the data is living on your server, but um, as the clients are, are using records and uh, creating found sets, uh, running reports, they are having to download all that data to their local machine or their iPad or iPhone. And what, whatever you can do to minimize the number of records that they download, and also the complexity of the records can help. Um, as Ms. Al noted, um, I have done some talks in the past, but hopefully those are still available on the uh, community uh, website, um, talking about how you can, if you have uh, really large data fields, it can actually make sense to split a record so that really huge data is not downloaded all the time. Um, to your clients, you know, if you have narrower records, it can really help to minimize the network traffic. That's what else for now. Turn it back over to Rick. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, really appreciate that. Um, Connor and and Wade, I want to throw this over to you next. Um, wonder where you want to go. And the question here is, what are some performance troubleshooting tools that you can recommend? Uh, absolutely, I'd be happy to, to make that one. Um, I use different tool sets uh, depending on what platform I'm working on. And uh, just for just for some background, I've done a lot of uh, troubleshooting a FileMaker server. Um, a lot of you have seen me in, at the tech support booth at previous uh, dev cons, and I've been working in the support infrastructure for uh, close to 10 years before uh, joining the QA team. Um, so I, this this is one of my favorite topics about servers: how to find the problems and fix the bugs. Um, so if we're uh, looking at Windows, um, of course, you've got 
task manager that you can monitor uh, you know, how much CPU and RAM is being taken up by each of the file maker server processes. Uh, but then there's also um, a, a hidden tool suite that's uh, called System Terminals that is put out by Microsoft that has just a lot of cool stuff too that I'm not sure how, how many people in our community are aware of. Uh, a specific one is called Process Explorer, which gives you a little bit more detail about each of those um, file maker processes. You can actually see the threads that are running and get a little bit more um, out of each one. Um, on Mac OS, of course, you've got Activity Monitor to uh, monitor those same types of things. And um, for anyone who's running uh, Xcode on Mac OS, there's a, a developer tool called Inspector, which just, again, get, goes into a really robust analysis of these processes. Um, on, on both platforms, and that we've, we've got probably was my favorite feature of FileMaker Server is uh, the top call stats log. Um, of, of all the performance cases that I've worked on, that's usually my go-to. Let's start here. Let's get um, first baseline of, of all the stats logs. And then for specifically top call stats, not only can you see uh, what types of operations are happening on the server, you can see which of the users um, are responsible for the slowdown. And um, I, I don't know if this is the right time to talk about it, but there's uh, uh, ways to take the table IDs and field IDs that you get out of the top call stats logs. And uh, those can be searched into uh, the XML DDR of your solution to get real field names, real table names. And so that's, uh, uh, there's just a whole lot that's, that's there that you can do on your own um, to sort of figure out where you need to, to begin your focus. Great. Know, Wade, uh, did you want to add to that? Yeah, Wade, you're muted. There you go. Oh, all right. uh, thank you, Connor. Uh, thank you, Rick. Uh, yeah, so, so Connor actually had a very, very, very detailed description that uh, uh, besides that, actually, in the 19 point Point one ETS version. Actually, we offer some more tool inside ourselves. So, for example, you can enable to see the remote call timing information. So that will give you some more detailed information about each request response and time spent. And also, we offer some other other debug and, and feature flag. So you can, for example, you can toggle the pro cache on or off. So if you haven't tried download the, the our 19.1 ETS, ETS version, I will suggest you download it and try. We would love to see feedback from you. Thank you. Thanks, Wade. Um, and bring it up to 19.1 and sort of what's coming on the horizon. Well, we can't tell you the exact date. Remember, we are uh, moving um, much more in an agile fashion. We certainly aren't waiting uh, the year uh, in between server releases, which means we can move a lot faster. And I'll tell you our philosophy for FileMaker Server is first and foremost, its job is to be stable, right? Its second job is to be performant. Uh, and some of the stuff, and Lucy, I'll, I'll probably turn this over to you and then, and then uh, you can probably call on some of your team who uh, is most knowledgeable about this, but some of the things that are coming down the pike in 19, Point one that really excite me related to performance are things like use of a sharing lock um, for HBAM file access, um, the parallel index find operations, sorting on the host, uh, and memory-based key comparison during indexing. And all of these things, I think, have the potential to significantly uh, enhance the performance of server. Um, so Lucy, uh, um, what can uh, you say about that or, and who on your team uh, is best to sort of uh, go a, a little bit deeper on the implications of these things? Sure, I'm Lucy Chen, VP of Engineering for FileMaker Platforms. I joined 25 years ago and that was the first year of uh, DevCon. 25 years, a lot have changed. Just today to see John Thatcher, Clay, Wade and the crew talking to 1,200 people online bring me to tears for a moment. 
I want to say that COVID has changed how we think, how we do things, and we have to do it with less people and more work with the difficulties in de-densifying work environments. So time is definitely the critical part and speed is part of the things that we really want to do our best for the FileMaker platform, for a whole new way to support our customers. So PH, PSR is definitely the key thing. We spend a lot of effort on this and it's coming soon, it's exciting. We also come with some blogs with it. It's coming often in the next few months. So I wanna have Wade E jump in to, dis to describe the things that we've done for PSR in 19.1 coming. So Wade, why don't we start with you? Uh yeah, so, so the, the thing is uh, in 19.1 19 is uh, basically we still keep the PLL code, the page level locking code in there. However, we, we actually we disable by default in the, the 19, FileMaker 19 release. So we keep that disabled. I will suggest you probably keep that disabled. And on the other hand, we have tried really hard, we'll try different ways to first to improve the stability and reliability and and try to keep the same level of performance of page level locking. So I'm happy to share with you. So we find out the sharing lock uh, it can achieve a similar kind of performance and some, some of them actually in internal tests that could be even better than page level locking. Yeah. So Besides that, we have uh, tried some uh, different things, like, like we try to facilitate uh, like a parallel index file and uh, sort on server. And we even try to like a parallel sort and uh, like a com compare multiple label key uh, ref in memory instead of in disk space. So we have tried quite a lot of these things so again, like I uh, suggested before, please, uh, pre if you haven't tried the ETS version, please sign up and download it and give us feedback. So Craig, do you want to add a couple more, couple more colors about the sort or other things? Thank you. You're muted, Clay. <laughs> yeah. Um I guess seeing some questions about what parallel finds are, but uh, our sorts are. It, it, it's basically just taking taking the the list of records and having threads sort different sections of them and doing. It's basically a, a merge sort on using multiple threads. And and um, uh, we we've, we've been playing around with this technology over the different years and stuff like that. And we we found different issues because because everything's interrelated. The the HBAM changes that uh, uh, Wade was mentioning about doing the sharing lock. Uh, it, there, there's kind of like four levels of locking that have been in HBAM over its lifetime now. There was the, the 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 exclusive lock that only one thing at all could work in HBAM. Then there was the file level locks. And then we went all the way down to page level locking, which was a very fine grain locking, which was completely very complex. But now we, we've uh, this sharing lock that, uh, that uh, Wade is talking about is kind of a, a halfway point between file locking and page level locking. It, it, it does a sharing lock on the file level. And we found out that it's a lot simpler process. And uh, when page level locking was done first, we thought we had to go down and do this very low grain locking. But we found out that uh, the, the performance of FileMaker is actually uh, nearly the same as page level locking if we just go to the simpler sharing lock. So we're, we're making the code simpler. And when you make things simpler, like uh, uh, Nick and Mark have been mentioning, you know, simple is faster, no matter what you're doing. So we're, we're, we're trying to go through and make things simpler there. Uh, the, the sorting we've tried around, the sorting to do on parallel, to have multiple threads doing sorting, we need the sharing lock at least, or page level locking. It, uh, we implemented it a long time ago in the, the, the two levels of locking, the slower level locking stuff, you didn't get any performance improvement. So we've been waiting for HBAM to do that. The uh, sorting on server has been another thing that has been laying around and has been requiring things like parallel sorting on the server so we've had these different things laying around all these different times and um some something that we've done different now in the ets program that you've heard about is that 
we basically have put everything inside the product now and uh, the ETS people can turn on things on and off to, to try out different combinations and see how it affects their solutions because it's kind of hard for us to figure out everything that everyone is doing and having a larger testing group going through to, to say, oh, you know, you know, you know, this person A may have, oh, parallel sorting is working great on me, but for, you know, person B, it really is, you know, slows down completely. So then that goes back to Connor and Connor has to figure out why, uh, yeah. <laughs> what's going on and why there's a difference there. So, um, and Connor, thanks you for that. Yes. Um, uh, hey, Clay, I've got a couple of follow-up questions. People asking, what is HBAM? Can you give oh. a real quick uh, explanation of what that is? Uh, like Jen mentioned, you can go back to some previous talks that we've given, you know, um, uh, the, 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 the HBAM is the, uh, how we store everything inside FileMaker. There's one FileMaker file. It's a big B tree. Uh, you can look up uh, B tree is a very common, um, computer, uh, storage mechanism. And we split this B tree across all these 4k blocks that the FileMaker files built in. And HBAM is basically the layer that takes these. Is, uh, the B tree is like a tree, so data is stored at leaves, and you have all these branches, and each branch has a path to it. And so, like record A may be on uh, table A, the table A branch in the record three branch, and then in the twig of fourteen is where the field is stored. And HBAM is the thing that figures out the, the these uh, addresses, these branches and twigs, and where the leaf is actually stored, which block on disk that thing is stored in. I mean, when you have multiple people <clears throat> accessing this stuff, you have to have a, a, a like a, a cop saying who can talk to which block at which time, who can make writes to these blocks, who can do reads to these blocks. And that's the different locking levels that we've been playing around, which PLL had a cop basically almost at every leaf um, where the, the sharing lock has has like one main cop and three little ones running around doing other things, which is simpler. And the, the previous locking one, you know, just had, you know, one manager that said yes and no one at a time. So, which is the slowest thing. So, um, uh, the, so the HBAM is basically the low level storage mechanism that's underneath everything. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, now, Yi, um, I'm going to shoot this over to you and Wade may have some, um, some comments here as well, but I have a question here about what are some of the performance enhancements that are coming to FileMaker Cloud? Um, I, I think we, we see the one major issue is the uh, completeness of the data centers. So currently we just have uh, Frankfurt uh, online on July 28th. So if if your purchase order is in the Europe European a areas, um, you should move to the Frankfurt uh, data center. That should give a, a better performance. I, I saw some one, one question is about the customer in UK. Um, they probably did a trial before the data Frankfurt data center is available. So I will suggest them to try again, uh, since that's just uh, online like last week. Um, and we are doing other improvement. I think we already mentioned a lot of enhancement is happening on 19.1 and uh, all the server enhancement cloud will have all the same enhancement as well. And also we are improving the uploading speed. Great. Uh, Wade, do you have anything to add to that? You're, you're muted, Wade. Yeah. So, so, the, so, so the thing is, we understand the latency issue is important. So actually, we are investigate, investigate uh, uh, potentially uh, different te techniques to, to improve it. Yeah. So, we are actively in investigate. Uh, maybe say we use leverage some kind of compression or better compression or other things to optimize the up, optimize the the traffic the round the round trip. And I will highly suggest we have a blogger talking about to optimize the solution so to cut down your round trip traffics. So if your solution use less round trip round trip traffic between client and the cloud server, then for sure the speed will that will speed up your solution. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, 
you know, following up on hardware, and I'll throw this out to uh, to anyone on the panel. Um, over the years, we've often heard of people saying, "Well, gosh, I just have my server running on a Mac Mini under my desk, and you know, it's also got other services like mail server and so on." And our advice has always been. If you've got something business critical, that is a value and you should dedicate hardware to that. So maybe, Mark, I'll start with you on what are your um, thoughts on sort of the hardware that you should dedicate to uh, to your founding server? So I'm certainly not the best um, candidate to answer hardware questions because I don't deal with them very often, but I think that's somewhat telling. You know, my impression is that um, whereas it used to be we had dedicated servers uh, and that was the standard on-prem, as we move to the cloud or even as clients have virtualized their own infrastructures, it's become clear to me that the separation of hardware really doesn't exist anymore. I mean, there's shared data storage systems and they're being virtually segregated. And so even if the mail server is on another box, it's still using the same storage tool. And odds are that tool has moved to a fiber based, you know, a back end or has a much larger plane. And so as a result, um, the performance improvement is getting better all the time. It, it feels to me like that's important and certainly in large solutions with large data, uh, lots of data or lots of users. Um, what kind of hardware you've, or resources, I should say, you've allocated in your virtual machine to service that particular solution and box is important. And if that particular operating system on that particular virtual machine is doing all sorts of other things, um, then you're going to definitely, you know, start to fight for those cores and, and I guess you could argue fight for some of the IO to that storage. But it feels to me at least that, um, you know, for the average solution out there, for the, for the typical medium to small business that's running a FileMaker solution, uh, hardware is um, rarely a major obstacle unless it's dramatically under provisioned. So yeah, the Mac mini on your desk for 25 users, probably not gonna be good if they're really relying on that solution all day. Uh, but if they have a reasonably well provisioned Windows virtual machine that uh, has adequate resources, you know, to the minimum or slightly better than what uh, Claris recommends, odds are if you're having bottlenecks in your solution and it's an average solution, it may not be the hardware to point a finger at. Hey, Nick, what has been your experience um, on the hardware side as far as the uh, impact? I think I think it's very difficult. The reason that this is all, this question has been coming up for years and years and years and no one ever gives a particularly straight answer on it is because there are so many variables. So the approach that we took was to develop a tool to load test and the load testing method we're using, which is just using um, the form script on server without waiting for these things to conclude so that each session that runs is essentially a virtual user is I think the same one that is used internally at FileMaker. And if you've got a certain setup that you know performs in a certain way, if you run DS Benchmark or something that does a similar thing, I think um, other people have produced similar tools on it, look at the data you get and then try running the same set of tests on another possible provision, you can then get a very clear um, idea of whether the other provision is going to provide better or worse performance and the extent of it. And of course, with as, as Mark's saying, with virtual boxes, you can tweak, you can decide to pay for a bit more resource. Um, with a well-designed system, as a system that's actually been designed to run well on WAN, you can do quite a lot with a relatively modest hardware footprint. The performance of FileMaker Server now, compared to the performance we were seeing with, for example, FileMaker 13, is immeasurably better. I mean, it has got significantly better over the last few years and obviously additional loads being put on it with additional features and stability, et cetera. But it says it's so much better than it was um, in say 2014. So ultimately I agree with Mark that the hardware isn't really the problem it used to be, but just taking a basic engineering approach and saying, let's just test it, let's measure it, let's see what it'll do. Then you're actually working with some facts as opposed to merely opinion. Great, thanks. You know, I've got a question coming in, um, probably to one of our um, internal um, server engineers, and the, it's asking, um, are there differences in performance uh, between using Linux versus Mac or Windows? Um, do we have any um, in, information there? So let's assume that, you know, all intents and purposes, the 
performance of, of whatever service or box or VM you're using is, is, is equal. Anyone want to take that uh, internally? I can take that. Okay. Um, I think we see comparable performance. And uh, I think the Linux is server is kind of established pretty stable. And I think uh, um, for all the engineers working with Linux, we, we find that very attractive. So I think customers should really try out the Linux server solution. Um, they'll be pretty impressed. Um, so we have the ETS for on-premise Linux. So I would suggest all the people listening should try this out. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Yi. And just a reminder, um, when we shipped um, uh, yeah, FileMaker uh, 19, um, we did release a developer preview of Linux server. So if you already have a license for server, you can download that and play with it. Um, we have had a, a, an additional release um, just a, a while back, a few weeks back. Uh, our intention is um, by the end of summer that we will have a fully certified shipping version of Linux server, um, which is just the beginning of, of where we're heading. Uh, uh, with our, our Linux server. Um, uh, you may be aware that, of course, our Linux, uh, Linux server was first ported for FileMaker Cloud, and so we're leveraging uh, those same technologies. Um, we did have a question that came um, as the run-up to engage um, that came up on this panel page, and um, it says, what is the difference in terms of performance between defining a field as a stored calculation type and defining it as auto enter field with the same calculation. And then the caveat uh, uh, unchecked uh, is do not replace existing value in field. So in other words, what event trigger the calculation of a, uh, a stored calc field to, what, what event triggers the calculation to stored calc to reevaluate versus what events trigger the auto, auto field Reevaluated, and then there's a note here that they add is this question is about calculation fields that can be stored. So is that a John or a Clay um, uh, question or someone else um, uh, on the panel? I guess I can give a quick stab at it. Uh, uh, the calculated fields are all uh, based off the the dependency uh, of what other fields it depends on. And that's what triggers it. If, if one of these other fields change, then it'll be recalculated. And there's been many talks about uh, uh, the dependency tree, and that can get a pretty complex. I think there's one called shaking the dependency tree. Um, uh, just search for that. And that's what triggers uh, the, the, the calculated fields. And they can be triggered anytime a record is updated. Uh, so the, the record, act, whenever a, any field changes and a calc has to change it. Uh, the auto enter fields, um, you pretty much just have to look at the auto enter uh, panel and see, and, and it, it kind of mentions when it'll be, when the calc will be updated, whether it's being updated at creation time or when the record gets modified. Um, it, it isn't dependent on um, uh, other fields changing. It usually requires some type of special action by the user to cause the auto enter calc to be uh, re re pulled. Uh, I mean, lookups are based in there. So um, that is kind of one trigger. If you have a lookup auto enter, um, that may cause it. But it, usually you have to do a modify record or uh, uh, create record uh, or some other specific operation. Now, the, the, the calcs that are actually performed are, are identical. The, 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 when the calc is actually Execute it. There is no difference between an auto enter calc and a calculated field. It's just the trigger points. Rick, could I just come in on that? Sure, Nick. Go ahead. The, the question is is alluding to a point that is, is 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 a really good performance tip, which is to use these auto enter fields rather than calculated fields. Certainly, the thing that um, I got years ago from I think Bruce Robertson was a was putting in a tickler, and I've known many other people do a very similar thing. So essentially, if you add a very simple field, um, which is going to be something like itself plus one, say, um, and you include that within the uh, expression in the auto enter field, then it's quite easy to make these auto enter fields update automatically whenever you want them to do it. It's a, it you can do it in different ways, but basically it's creating an artificial thing that gives it that little stimulus to tickle it so it does actually update 
I, I guess that's I guess that is a performance technique that yeah uh, that you can use. So, uh, you know, we were talking about stored calculated fields, but you know, one of the big performance problems is unstored calculated fields because they can't be stored. What you can do with an auto enter field is basically get a stored version of a calculated field, just as Nick mentioned about the tickling mechanism. It's just that the the, the problem you have to worry about, and, and you have to think about this with your solution, is that you need to know when you need to do the tickling to update those values. So you, you could actually have a complex uh, calc based on related fields that would normally be unstored as a calculated field, but you could put it as an auto enter calc and as long as you know when those uh, related fields change or whenever you need to update the value, you go through and tickle, you know, force the, the calc to, uh, the auto enter calc to get uh, executed again, and it'll put the value into the stored field. So then your indexes will be uh, created and your searches and finds and uh, display of data will be a lot quicker too. But uh, the, 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 uh, you can't really come up with a very general mechanism for knowing when to do that tickle. You have to know your solution, how the relationships are set up, when the records change and stuff like that. But that is one of the techniques to really speed up the solution is how to turn an unstored calc into a stored calc by making it an auto enter and you controlling the dependencies of when it gets uh, triggered. Thanks a lot, Clay. Um, we are coming uh, to the end of this. You can see our screen coming up. I would really like to thank our panelists uh, and, and the time they, they have spent preparing for this um, and participating in it. It is quite a value. I think that um, Rosemary said we will um, post to the community all of the rich resources. We have a number of under the hood sessions that have been recorded over the years uh, by, by John um, Thatcher and Clay Makel and uh, you know uh, Andrew Paulson. Maybe we even have some out there from Chris Krim. Those are always great resources are on our YouTube channel. Um, and as reference, um, I would definitely recommend those. Um, and um, hope you join us in 15 minutes. Um, our next panel is driving customers towards modern design experience. And with that, I'd uh, like to thank you again. And again, thank you to the panelists. And John, it is so great to see you. Uh, a lot of us are, are just thrilled that you could join us here. So um, thanks a lot, all. Bye. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.